freezing cold, oppressive heat, devastating drought. Extreme climate change may have contributed to the extinction of the Neanderthals and allowed modern Homo sapiens to dominate the Earth. All life on Earth is subject to the power of climate. Civilizations evolve or vanish forever. Favorable climatic conditions support the rise of great empires and promote trade, prosperity and artistic achievement. Adverse climatic events often lead to war and other human catastrophes. Almost 14 billion years ago, immense forces created the universe. The Big Bang spawned vast galaxies, each with millions and millions of stars, moons and planets. Among these is one small blue planet, our Earth. Water, warmth and the Earth's protective atmosphere create something that may be unique in the universe, a climate that makes life possible. As the oceans formed and the continents drifted apart, the Earth developed seasons. Temperature differences between land and water produced winds and land bridges shaped the ocean currents. But climate has always been prone to sudden change, often with dramatic consequences for life on Earth. 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs were the unchallenged masters of the prehistoric world until their sudden demise. A meteor strike triggered volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. The ensuing climatic chain reaction wiped out the giant reptiles. After the age of the dinosaurs, the earth cooled Climate change also affected our ancestors. Early hominids had to survive periods of both extreme heat and extreme cold. Most were unable to adapt and died out. Then, over thousands of years, the polar ice caps expanded. As did the Earth's alpine glaciers. Around 60,000 BC, Average temperatures were about five degrees colder than they are today. This had a huge impact. Arctic sheet ice extended all the way to Europe. So much water was frozen that sea levels became up to 100 metres lower. The icy temperatures also affected the land. The ground was not only frozen solid, but also extremely dry. Where the ice ended, there were stretches of tundra and taiga. If you look at Western Europe as a place to live, you find that there are two challenges. One, you find that you have very cold conditions, particularly in winter, but during the summer, because the ice is so far south, you have this wonderful sort of like high energy environment. So it doesn't stay stable for a very long period. And you have this sort of oscillating extremes going through the ice age, which then stress any creatures that are living there at that time. But one hominid genus was resistant to these stresses. The Neanderthals were suited to these extreme conditions. They not only survived the climatic variations, but developed an impressive range of skills. Neanderthals were adept at hunting large animals and knew how to light fires. 
They were the first hominids to develop successful strategies for coping with climatic variation. Stellen Sie sich heute Sommer vor, in dem es nur gerade mal so 10 Grad warm wird. Das sind, das sind ganz andere Lebensbedingungen. Ne? Dann leben wir hier in unseren Regionen wie heute nördlich des Polarkreises. In the Neanderthals caves, fires kept temperatures constant. They made warm clothes from animal skins. The key thing for surviving cold climates is to avoid frostbite. So the key things that you want to actually protect in cold climates, of course, your fingers, your toes, your nose, and of course, genitalia if you happen to be a male. Neanderthals were short and stocky. Their body surface area was quite small relative to their body mass, but they had lots of muscle, which generates heat. They had the perfect anatomy for surviving in an ice age. The Neanderthals' main problem was their diet. They needed to consume large quantities of meat to sustain their muscle mass. So they preferred to hunt large animals. In summer, when the ice receded for a few weeks, they hunted mammoth and other big game. Hunting was physically demanding and dangerous, but Neanderthals needed animal protein and vitamins to survive the long winters. They often tracked their prey over long distances. When you look at a Neanderthal, they are tough, they are cold adapted, and you would expect them to survive and thrive in the Ice Ages. And they did thrive while the climate was stable. But then, quite suddenly, it changed. The climate has always been subject to large but predictable fluctuations. Most of these are caused by the Sun, the centre of our solar system. As the Earth revolves, the Sun's rays strike its surface. At some times, its orbit is more circular, at others, more elliptical. One orbital cycle takes 100,000 years. The angle of the Earth's axis also moves in a 40,000-year cycle. These changes cause regular climatic variations on Earth, as the intensity of solar radiation increases and decreases. Other influences on the Earth's climate, such as fluctuations in sea currents, are irregular. The Gulf Stream, for example, works like a giant heat pump, moving warm water towards Europe. The Gulf Stream is the most important climate element that we have ever had. The other elements in the climate system, like the sun exposure, change the climate maximum to 2 degrees. When the Gulf Stream anspringt oder äh, schwach wird, das sind im Nordatlantik Veränderungen von 8 Grad, 6 bis 8 Grad. Das ist einfach viel, viel mehr. Climatologists are investigating how changes in the Gulf Stream affected the Neanderthals. The answers lie hidden in Germany's Eiffel Mountains, deep in the lakes that have formed in Mar, the craters of extinct volcanoes. These scientists are doing pioneering work. They use sophisticated technology to reconstruct the Earth's prehistoric climate from its own natural records. Using a special drill, they're taking core samples from the sediment of Mar lakes in the Eiffel Mars region. For thousands of years, pollen has settled in these oxygen-poor waters and been perfectly preserved. For scientists, the lakes provide a unique climatic record. The core samples are fragile. They have to be frozen with liquid nitrogen so they don't disintegrate on their way to the surface. Every sample that's brought up intact opens a door to the past. The pollen layers allow the scientists to draw conclusions about climatic conditions thousands of years ago. The Earth never forgets. 
and the climate leaves a unique footprint. After. Now the research team from the University of Mainz can start reading the Climate Chronicle. Das Besondere an diesen Kernen aus den Seen der Mare ist, dass wir keinen Sauerstoff im Bodenwasser hier haben und deswegen jede einzelne Jahresschicht erhalten bleibt. Und wie in einem Tagebuch können wir Schicht für Schicht analysieren und Schicht für Schicht das Klima des jeweiligen Jahres rekonstruieren. The older the period they want to investigate, the deeper the scientists need to drill. One millimeter of the sample equals one year. A metre-long sample takes them back in time 1,000 years. At a depth of 40 metres, the researchers reach the era of the Neanderthals. The Eiffel Mars are an ideal location for this research because the Neanderthals lived in this region. The Neander Valley, where the first Neanderthal skeleton was found, is just 150 kilometres away. The core samples reveal what conditions were like for the Neanderthals when the Gulf Stream became erratic. The dark layers of Earth indicate periods with mild climates and extensive forest cover. Lighter layers indicate periods when barren steppes covered the area and summers were four degrees colder than today. About 60,000 years ago, the climate changed suddenly, with dramatic consequences for the Neanderthals. Also wir sehen, dass es ganz schnelle Änderungen in dem Klima gegeben hat. Die warmen Phasen und die kalten Phasen wechseln ganz abrupt ab. Und in zehn Jahren springt das hier. There were ten cold and hot phases in quick succession. The landscape and the vegetation changed rapidly. Humans and nature were under constant stress. This climate chaos pushed the Neanderthals to their limits and threatened their very existence. The Neanderthal had to this time in a Waldvegetation äh, gelebt. Und in zehn Jahren befindet er sich in einer offenen Steppe. Und sein Wild, was er normalerweise gewohnt ist zu jagen, ist nicht mehr da. Von daher sind solche schnellen Klimawechsel in zehn Jahren eine extreme Herausforderung für eine Gesellschaft, die eben halt rein auf Jagd äh, basiert. First, the Neanderthals' prey disappeared. Many animals were unable to find enough food and starved. Others migrated away. Suddenly, the Neanderthals were hunters with no prey. At the same time, a competitor moved into their territory. Homo sapiens evolved in the warm climate of East Africa and slowly migrated all the way to Europe. The newcomers seemed completely unsuited to this harsh and changeable climate. Homo sapiens was tall and slender, with long arms and legs. This build made them extremely susceptible to cold. But they overcame this disadvantage thanks to a new skill. It's been argued that Homo sapiens had a very different shoulder, so they could actually throw spears. Whereas if we look at the shoulders of Neanderthals, they're so big and chunky that actually that ability to throw probably wasn't there. And actually they were much more likely to be thrusting spears. Throwing spears allowed Homo sapiens to kill much faster animals from a distance. The revolutionary invention made hunting for meat much easier. The Neanderthals, who'd been the masters of Europe, lost their fight for survival. They weren't adaptable enough to save their species. The last of them died on the rock of Gibraltar about 24,000 years ago. The clear winner in this time of climate change was Homo sapiens. 
we still share about 99% of our genetic material with these ancient humans. After migrating to Europe from Africa, Homo sapiens spread to India and Asia, then via land bridges to Australia and America. During this mass migration, they settled in some of the most remote corners of the Earth. The key to that was the adaptability, the ability to understand the environment, how it's changing, and to work with large social groups to be able to actually deal with that changing landscape. And for me, this is the point where humans first started to adapt to the climate and use the climate for their own good. During a time of unprecedented climate chaos, humans developed a unique ability, surviving in changing climates. This allowed them to withstand the last millennia of the Ice Age, a time of extreme cold. The Ice Age gradually came to an end around 17,000 BC due to changes in the Earth's orbit. As the Earth moved closer to the Sun, life changed dramatically. The sunlight grew stronger, particularly in summer. The icy planet was about to experience a global spring. It took several thousand years for the Sun to warm the entire globe. As the Earth's climate became much milder, a new era began and has continued until the present day. Warmer temperatures led to changes in the environment. First, the ice sheets in the Arctic and Antarctic began to melt. The oceans also began to warm and the Gulf Stream began to flow again. As temperatures rose, more and more moisture evaporated into the atmosphere. This led to regular rainfall, which triggered a burst of plant growth. There was increased biodiversity. Mixed forests spread across Europe and North America, and subtropical forests flourished closer to the equator. New animal species started to populate the fertile plains. Es kommt zu einem Aufblühen der Biosphäre. Die Grassteppen nehmen zu, die Tierherden nehmen zu. Der Mensch hat also eine sehr viel reichhaltigere Umwelt als am Ende der Eiszeit zur Verfügung, vor allen Dingen auch was pflanzliche Nahrungsmittel betrifft. Er gleitet sozusagen ins Paradies hinein. Along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and in the eastern Mediterranean, abundant natural resources created ideal living conditions. At the ancient site of Gebekli Tepe are 60 stone steels engraved with the images of animals, including foxes, wild boar and water birds. Nomadic peoples may have worshipped these figures because wild animals supplied them with meat and skins. Auch Sammler Jägergesellschaften können in dieser reicheren Umwelt sich viel stärker entfalten. Das ist das Beispiel von Göbekli Tepe, wo wirklich eine reichhaltige Architektur sich entwickelt hat als Zentrum von umherziehenden noch Sammler Jägergruppen, aber sowas wäre in den harschen Bedingungen der Eiszeit einfach nicht möglich gewesen. Also of great benefit to humans and animals were the wild grains growing in the warm sunshine of the fertile crescent. Einkorn, spelt and emma grew all across the Middle East. They're among the oldest grain varieties on Earth. Easily stored, these grains could be eaten all year round and so provided humans with a reliable food source. As the seasons became more regular, humans began to cultivate these wild cereals. They observed the cycles of nature and by experimenting, 
soon learned the best times to sow crops. Agriculture revolutionised prehistoric societies. Many abandoned their nomadic lives and became farmers and cattle breeders. For the first time, humans began to settle down and build villages. They no longer needed to travel to find food. Prior to agriculture, people were hunter-gatherers and moving around, and everybody, from the very eldest to the very youngest, were all concentrating on collecting and hunting for food, because that was essential. As soon as you have the agricultural revolution, and agriculture starts, suddenly not everyone is involved in food production. And allowing people to have the freedom to actually do other things allows society to build. Once they'd settled in villages, people began to specialise and develop their skills. They invented techniques that allowed them to make new, valuable objects for their communities. You have specialists who are then farmers, you have specialists who are then looking after cattle and goats and other domesticated animals, and then other people can then develop specialisations. So for example, if you're settled in one place, then you will want people who are specialised in building. So you can actually then have houses built or you can have buildings built. And so you then start to free up people from the manual labour of just producing food. Pottery, metalwork and weaving changed people's lives. So did more humble inventions, like bread and beer. Over the centuries, villages grew into towns. One of the oldest is Jericho, on the banks of the River Jordan. Other cities in the area were Chatalhuyuk, Eridu and Ur. This cradle of civilization benefited from a long period of favorable climatic conditions. Tatsächlich ist es so, dass der Beginn von Bodenbau und Viehzucht ein Quantensprung ist, ein globaler Quantensprung der Menschheitsgeschichte, von der es nur ganz wenige gibt, vielleicht die Ausbreitung des anatomisch modernen Menschen, die Entwicklung von Städten und die Entwicklung unserer Industriegesellschaft. Das sind wirklich die ganz großen Umbrüche, in der sich global die Menschheit verändert hat und wo wirklich neue technologische Grundlagen geschaffen worden sind, die ganz anders waren als vorher. Around the same time, a disaster was looming in North America. Part of a continental ice sheet melted and created a vast lake. It continued to grow until it covered an area of 440,000 square kilometers, far bigger than any lake existing today. The intense sunlight caused the lake to grow as more and more meltwater flowed into it from the mountains. At first, ice barriers held back this huge volume of water. But around 6200 BC, they too began to melt, and disaster was inevitable. The barriers around Lake Agassiz collapsed. A huge amount of icy water was released. It flooded large parts of North America and eventually drained into the Atlantic. The immense inflow of cold water upset the currents in the Atlantic. It disrupted the Gulf Stream, which ceased to have a warming effect. Temperatures dropped all across Europe in the Fertile Crescent, where agriculture had so recently allowed humans to make enormous progress, the weather suddenly became cold and dry. This led to devastating droughts, and crops failed. The new agrarian societies lost their livelihoods. Uh, 
Trockenphasen sind fataler für bäuerliche Gesellschaften, einfach weil das Getreide nicht keimt oder am Halm verdorrt. Nicht? Da lässt sich dann gar nichts mehr machen. Bäuerliche Gesellschaften brauchen natürlich auch eine gewisse Regensicherheit. Da ist es so, dass diese Gesellschaften im Grunde dem Regen hinterherlaufen. The first ever climate refugees came from the eastern Mediterranean. Many thousands left in search of a new Eden. Some ventured as far as Europe, where temperatures were still relatively mild and fertile soil promised ideal conditions for settlement. Others stayed in the Middle East, but moved further south. Everywhere they went, these migrants introduced agriculture. They preferred to settle along rivers or on the coast, anywhere they had a reliable supply of fresh water and food. But even in moderate climate zones, the settlers were not safe. The dangers caused by the North American meltwater were far from over. Sea levels rose 120 meters. All over the world, humans found their very existence threatened. Gradually, the sea reclaimed vast tracts of fertile land, and rising sea levels flooded settlements in river deltas and along coasts. The Bible tells of these events in one of its best-known stories. God told Noah to gather all the world's animals on his ark, two of each kind, and take them to safety. The rest of humanity was to be punished in a devastating deluge. Noah did God's bidding. If you look into almost all human societies, there are stories about the Great Flood. And the reason for this is because key period of time between 10,000 and 5,000 years ago, after the last ice age, sea levels continue to rise. And that flood, all those societies that are affected by that sea level rise, has really impinged upon our psyche and has embedded itself in our stories about the end of the world. The Bible is not the only book that tells of a great flood and an ark. The mountainous waves and the deluge that destroyed everything in its path are also vividly described in the Epic of Gilgamesh from ancient Mesopotamia and the Quran. Tribal peoples in South America also tell of a vast flood that covered the entire earth. It is said that people only survived by fleeing to the mountaintops. Indigenous Australians also refer to a great flood. The dramatic rise in sea levels thousands of years ago has become part of our collective memory. All around the world where people were, sea level rose and rose and rose until about 5,000 years. And we know that there are lots of areas that are completely flooded now that had society. So you can see cities underneath uh, the sea close to Malta and in Japan. We know that off the coast of the United Kingdom in the North Sea is Doggerland. And when you actually survey Doggerland, it has the imprint of villages of Neolithic tribes that used to live there that were flooded out. The rising sea levels changed the map of the world. In North America, Hudson Bay and the Great Lakes came into being. In Northern Europe, the Baltic Sea was formed. Japan, Indonesia and Australia became islands. The great glacial melt did not always bring devastation. One place that benefited was the Sahara. Today, it's a hot, arid and inhospitable region. But the Sahara may once have been very different. 
At an ancient site on the Gil Kabir Plateau in Egypt, archaeologists have uncovered surprising scenes from prehistoric times. They've found stenciled handprints, which were probably made by nomads or traders. An adjacent cave has rock paintings of humans standing alone and in groups. All this art was produced during the time of the Great Flood. While much of the world suffered, the Sahara appears to have been teeming with life. Many people lived here, and animal life was abundant. There were antelopes and lions. And even giraffes. What is now the world's largest sandy desert was once a fertile savanna. It was home to herds of animals that roamed rich pastures fed by a vast network of rivers and lakes. The change in this region's climate was influenced by another factor, monsoon winds. The Northern Hemisphere was receiving more heat from the sun because of a change in the tilt of the Earth's axis. Land masses store more heat than oceans, creating temperature differences that produce monsoon winds which carry cool, moist air inland. These winds brought rain and abundant life to what is now desert. If we look at the Sahara, we find that there is a huge period of time between about 12,000 years ago and five and a half thousand years ago where the Sahara was green. And by that, we mean that people were able to live there. And so we find archaeological finds all the way through the Sahara showing that people thrived there, there was clearly enough uh, food, agriculture was actually developing there, and then slowly, from about 7,000 years onwards, the Sahara started to expand. But this flowering of the Sahara and the abundance of water, wildlife and food plants was fated not to last. The fertile savanna land became a sandy desert, harsh, barren and largely uninhabited. The subtropical monsoon winds lasted only a relatively short time until the Earth's axis shifted again. As the sun's heat decreased, the monsoons lost their power. When plants die from drought, less moisture is retained in the soil. This accelerates the degradation of the land, and deserts form surprisingly quickly. Wenn der Monsoon ausbleibt, regnet es nicht mehr. Und da reichen sechs Wochen aus oder drei Monate und dann ist das Gras verdorrt und ist weg. Und wenn es im nächsten Jahr wieder nicht regnet und im nächsten Jahr wieder nicht regnet und dann haben sie gar keine Saat mehr, dann hat sich einfach eine Steppenlandschaft und eine Wüstenlandschaft äh, umgeformt. We know when the Sahara became a desert thanks to this ancient burial site in Niger, on what was once the shores of Lake Gobero. For many generations, the dead were buried here, along with objects such as bone fish hooks and jewellery made from hippopotamus tusks. But the burials seem to have ended quite abruptly in around 3500 BC. When the lake dried up, the inhabitants abandoned the burial site and all trace of them disappears. When the rain stopped, they had to leave. Drought had completely transformed the landscape. And this didn't just happen in the Sahara. All over the world, deserts began to form. The Taklamakan in Central Asia, Australia's Red Centre, the Namib and the Kalahari Deserts in Southern Africa.
This was the last major shift toward the Earth's current climatic patterns. That small change in the tilt of the globe caused the rains to stop in many subtropical regions. Once again, climatic change forced thousands to migrate. There was an exodus from the Sahara towards a fertile region in northern Africa. While inland rivers had dried up, the Nile in Lower Egypt was still a reliable source of water. On its banks, the migrants found fertile soils. The Nile Valley is Egypt's green heart, a verdant floodplain over 1,100 kilometres in length. The Great River provides ample water to irrigate the valley, which is surrounded by desert. Every summer, heavy rains in the Ethiopian highlands cause the river to break its banks. In September and October, the floodwaters recede, the soil dries out and the fields can be tilled. While they follow a regular yearly cycle, the Nile floods can be extreme. The early settlers had to adapt to these conditions. The climate refugees became skillful farmers and hydraulic engineers. The ancient Egyptians knew how to use every drop of the precious monsoon rains for their fields. Water flowed through a system of canals. To direct the water to where it was needed, they used locks and counterweighted buckets. This sophisticated irrigation system helped create an economic boom. The Nile made the region prosperous and fed increasing numbers of people. Egypt's first cities sprang up along the banks of the Nile. In den Flusstälern müssen jetzt viele Menschen leben. Das zwingt zur systematischen Ordnung des Lebens, zu einer straffen Organisationsform. Simple settlements soon evolved into Egypt's first kingdom. But the social and political system continued to revolve around safeguarding and managing the water supply. This was done with the help of an ingenious invention, the Nilometer, a stepped structure used to measure the level of the Nile floodwaters. The measurements were used to predict the effect of the flood each year. The Egyptian calendar was also based on this annual flooding. Arket was the season of inundation, Peret was the season of emergence, and Shemu was the harvest season. Man hat gelernt, die äthiopischen Regenfälle, die dann in den Nil hinunterströmen, nutzbar zu machen, sich nicht bedrohen zu lassen, sondern von ihnen zu profitieren. Das war die Grundlage für eine ausdifferenzierte, ertragreiche Landwirtschaft. Und dieser besondere Umgang mit dem Klima war insofern auch die Grundlage für das Entstehen der ägyptischen Hochkultur. This most famous of ancient civilizations was the product of favorable climatic conditions in the Nile Valley. The pharaohs were able to build and maintain the Egyptian empire over almost 3,000 years because the Nile provided all the necessary resources. The fundamental resource you need to build an empire is food and water. If you actually want artisans to build temples, you want soldiers to go off and fight wars for you, you have to be able to feed them and to water them. If you can ensure and protect your food supply and your water supply for all of your people, then you can start to build a large civilization. With key resources secured, the pharaohs oversaw a long period of stability. These powerful leaders were able to bring prosperity to their people. Hochkulturen entstehen da, wo das Klima es überhaupt zulässt oder wo das Klima die Menschen dazu treibt, Hochkulturen zu entwickeln. 
It wasn't just Egypt that flourished. Other civilizations arose between the latitudes of 20 and 40 degrees north. In Mesopotamia and Persia, in northern India, in Karakoram, in China, in Mexico and Peru, and in the Mediterranean, the Mycenaeans, Minoans, Thracians and Etruscans. All these cultures had similar climates. The kingdom of Kutna in modern-day Syria also blossomed during this period and established itself as one of the ancient world's most important economic centres. It controlled the major trade routes connecting North Africa and the Middle East. Bronze Age cultures had something else in common. Again, it was related to the climate, sun worship. Egyptians venerated the sun god. In southern England, the stone circles of Stonehenge marked the summer and winter solstices and may have been associated with sun worship. This structure in the German town of Gosek is a solar observatory. This sky disk, found in nearby Nebra, is thought to be an astronomical instrument. Many Bronze Age societies revered the sun as the giver of life. 2,000 years later, all this changed as the entire Mediterranean region entered a period that is sometimes called the Dark Ages of Antiquity. From about 1200 BC, civilizations collapsed one after the other. Sources refer to seafaring people who launched raids around the Aegean. Little is known about them, only that they always attacked from the sea. They ransacked towns and cities, leaving a trail of destruction wherever they went. From Greece to Gaza, no one was safe. Their raids marked the end of the Mediterranean civilizations of the Bronze Age. Researchers are still investigating the reasons behind the collapse of these kingdoms. They suspect that climate change may have played a role. But one of the reasons that these are called the Dark Ages is that there are so few written records dating from this time. Paleoclimatologist Dominic Fleitman hopes to shed light on this period using geological data from the Kocheyan Cave in southern Turkey. People have been visiting the cave for thousands of years because it provides not only shelter, but also water. Large pools were built in ancient times to collect the rainwater that seeps into the cave. Deeper inside the cave, this water has created a fascinating climate record, which Flightman is researching. The cave contains huge rock formations, including stalagmites up to 20 metres tall. Most are millions of years old. A walk in this cavern is also a journey through the area's climatic history. In diese Tropfsteine, das ist äh, versteinerter Regen. Und all die Informationen im Niederschlag sind in diesem Stein, Niederschlagsmenge, woher der Niederschlag kam, sind in diesem Stück Stein hier gespeichert. Und wir müssen alles daran tun, mit modernsten Labor- und Analysemethoden die Geheimnisse und diese Signaturen ähm, herauszufinden. The problem is that he needs to find just the right sample from among all these stalagmites. Many of these ancient formations stopped growing at the end of the Bronze Age, when water stopped entering the cave. Stalactites and stalagmites need a constant supply of water if they are to grow. 
They're formed by rainwater seeping through soil and dripping off rocks. The water leaves behind deposits of calcium carbonate, which accumulate over time. These fragile structures allow researchers to analyse rainfall patterns over millennia. The samples from Cochayan Cave indicate that the climate changed abruptly during the Bronze Age. Was wir an diesem Tropfstein sehen, ist, dass der untere Teil rechts, recht weißer Kalzit ist, ohne Staubeinschlüsse, ähm, ohne Staublagen. Und ungefähr in der Mitte des Stalagmiten, ähm, ungefähr der, der Bronzezeit entsprechend, Ende der Bronzezeit entsprechend, sehen wir eine Zunahme an Staublagen. This increase in dust layers shows that during the late Bronze Age, the climate became drier. This is confirmed by the rate at which the stalagmites grew, which slowed noticeably during the period. In contrast to preceding centuries, almost no new layers of limestone were added. This suggests a decrease in rainfall around the Mediterranean from about 1200 BC. The whole region was in the grip of drought. All die Parameter, die wir gemessen haben, sagen uns trocken und kalt. Also eigentlich das perfekte um, recipe for disaster. A recipe for disaster indeed, as recurring droughts affected the entire Mediterranean region. Soon soils were depleted. Fields could no longer be tilled. The mysterious seafarers who raided kingdom after kingdom were actually climate refugees. Huge numbers of migrants overran Egypt. Word had spread that it was rich in resources and that the pharaoh's granaries were well stocked. Ramesses III eventually won a resounding victory over the raiders. But their invasion of Egypt was the beginning of a prolonged, gradual decline. So the old kingdom ruled for hundreds and hundreds of years, and then a cold snap produced drought across the Middle East. The key problem with drought is it means that your food supply stops. If you don't have enough food, you can't feed people. Those people then either migrate to other places where there is food, or they actually start trying to produce food themselves. So what you have is every layer of government starts to collapse because you can't feed people that are trying to run the country. And you see that the old kingdom collapses. Egypt shows us the power of climate. So kingdoms fell because of a climate anomaly. Rainfall dropped substantially, and temperatures were the lowest they'd been since the end of the Ice Age. It wasn't until about 300 BC that the Earth's alignment again made the climate more favourable, with milder temperatures and regular rainfall. In the mountains, glaciers receded. The balance of nature was restored in the Mediterranean and beyond. The changes brought an end to the climate crisis and much needed relief to ecosystems all over the world, including Africa. Abundant rainfall replenished groundwater levels. Soils became fertile again and crops thrived in northern Africa. Emma, the most sought after export of the time, grew as far as the eye could see. Wir wissen, dass das in den Sommermonaten nur einige Tage waren, wo dann halt im Juni, Juli, August immer nur für fünf Tage mal Regen gefallen ist, aber das reicht dann eben halt schon, dass das Getreide wächst. This abundance attracted the attention of an emerging power, which obtained access to Africa's granaries by force. It subjugated its arch-enemy Carthage in the Punic Wars. 
and secured its food supply for centuries to come. The rising imperial power was Rome. During its golden age, more than 800,000 people lived in its bustling capital on the river Tiber. Famous for both its efficient administration and its extravagant lifestyle, the Roman Empire outshone all that had come before it. So weit wir auch zurückschauen, wir sehen immer Menschen, die der Gunst der Natur folgen und die Gunst der Natur ist da, wo das Klima so ist, dass ich aus der Natur heraus leben kann, dass ich Tiere finden kann, dass ich Pflanzen finden kann und die sind klimatisch abhängig und insofern ist Menschheitsgeschichte von Beginn an Klimageschichte und auch der Beginn von Kultur und Religion ist aufs engste mit dem Klima verknüpft. At home, Rome kept its people content with bread and circuses. Abroad, it expanded its empire. The climate favoured Rome. <laughs>